begin reading today then uh, in the book of Matthew, and then we're going to go to the book of Acts. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to begin reading in Matthew chapter 24, just to remind us of the context of the scripture. And then we're going to turn to Acts chapter 1. And then we're going to continue in our study as we look at some terminology and we define some key words, key phrases as we study what Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 24 and other places in the scripture. So I hope you're excited about this study and I hope this is something that you are reading and, and studying and praying about. So we're sometimes, I think as Christians, we sometimes make the mistake of not being informed in God's Word so that as we are progressing in the course of time and the course of events, if we're not prepared in this world, we ought to be a people that are gaining God's knowledge. He wants us to be a knowledgeable people. He wants us to be able to speak and to be able to share with others what God's doing and what God's planning to do. And so we're not to be a people blind. That's what the Bible describes the world as, the world that's without God and darkness. We are God's people, saved by God's grace, and we are to be an informed people. Spiritually, we have been given sight. Spiritually, we have been given ears to hear. And that is by His Spirit, we are to learn from His Word so that we can speak to the world. We can speak to people and share with them, this is God's plan. This is what God's going to do. And so we're not to be in the dark. We're to be in the light. And so let's pray that we are in the light. And so in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said in verse 7, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Now, I want to talk about signs of the times in a few weeks. But it's important for those listening to these videos and for you here today. Someone would say, well, what Jesus was saying could be describing any period of time. He says there's going to be wars, there's going to be famine, there's going to be earthquake. But what Jesus said, though, in verse 8 is the critical point of this scripture. He says these are the beginning of birth pains. And what he would say as was is that like a woman, as she approaches her delivery, the contractions, the pain, the intensity becomes more frequent and they become greater in magnitude. So what Jesus was saying, he was not saying that at the end of the times before Jesus comes back, he was just not saying there's going to be wars and famines. But what he's saying is those things, earthquakes, all of these things have existed in the world. But what we're seeing is, as the earth and nations, it seems like what Jesus was describing is that they're going to become more frequent and the magnitude is going to become greater and greater. So we're going to look at that uh, in a few weeks. We're going to look at the last century, for example, and we're going to, you'll be, I think, if you've ever done this before, you'll be very interested to see as you look through the progress of history and you come to the last century, and you look at the number of wars that the world experienced the last century. When we go from World War I, World War II, and so forth, even to present time. And we look at the number of earthquakes and we look at the deaths by natural events. You will find it shocking to see how different the last century has been since the records of time. And that's exactly what Jesus was describing. He was saying that these events, these natural events, and these events of hostility, of war, and the nations against nations, and the troublesome times in Israel, those things are going to be occurring with such frequency and great magnitude that you'll see that the earth, like an expecting mother about to deliver a child, that the times are demonstrating that Jesus is coming again. So that's what he was saying. When he said the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of birth pains, he was saying that these events are going to be happening more frequently and with greater intensity. And so this is exactly as we look at the course of events in the last century, exactly what we're seeing. 
But that, I'm jumping to that. That's a sign of the time, a, a great study that we want to get to. But here Jesus describes the beginning of birth pains. And then, as I said, we're going to read Acts chapter 1. And then, if you'll turn with me to verse 4, Jesus was speaking. And this is just before He ascended back to heaven. And He is to take His place next to the Father. And upon the throne, He has accomplished the victory of the resurrection. He has died on the cross. He's been raised again. And now He's presented Himself to hundreds of people. He's presented Himself to His faithful followers. And now He's about to ascend back to heaven. And here Jesus is speaking to His followers. And He says in verse 4 in Acts chapter 1, On one occasion while He was eating with them, He gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked Him, Lord, are You at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by His own authority. Now, we want to make very, I want to emphasize that what Jesus said. Because what He was warning against is perhaps you say, well, isn't that exactly what you're trying to do? And this is not at all what I'm trying to do to set up dates and times and say that on this date and time, Jesus is coming again. Here Jesus said, it's not for you to know the, the date. The Father has set that by His own authority. We're to live every day with the expectation that we're going to see Jesus. That's the only way to live. That's the only way to live in the joy. And that's the only way to live with the accountability. Is to live with that day by day, moment by moment expectation that I'm going to see Jesus. And I'm going to be in His presence. That's how we're to live every day. And so... That's really exactly what we are doing. We're living in the presence of Jesus day by day, moment by moment. That's what it means to be kingdom citizens. If we're part of God's kingdom, then we're living in the presence of God. Sometimes we make a mistake and we say, I can't, and we should. We should pray and say, Lord, I can't wait to see that day when Jesus comes again. That's the great promise. He said, I will come again. But yet, we don't want to miss this point. These days are even though they're filled with troubles and sorrows, but yet these are times that we should live in the joy of the Spirit. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, right? Love, joy, forbearance. These are the fruit of the Spirit. So we're to live every day as though we're living in the presence of God, for truly we are, because those who have been saved, those who are Christians, we are part of God's kingdom. We're going to talk about the kingdom today. So we don't want to miss that point. I, I fear sometimes, yes, we do live in troubles and trials and we have sorrows in our families, but yet we also should live with the joy that comes that we're living with God today. He lives in us. And there's joy and there's happiness. There's victory today. And so that's how Jesus wants to live as kingdom citizens. Here, though, Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father is set by His authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. So we live today as witnesses to the truth. Witnesses to the world. Sharing the gospel of the kingdom of God to all the world. And that's very important. We'll come to that again as signs of the times, because Jesus said, when... The end comes, it will follow the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom to all the earth. But I'm jumping ahead again. But here is a very important question. They asked him, when are you going to set up the kingdom to Israel? And so, let's look at that for a moment. We touched on this a little bit in these two terms. Times of the Gentiles, fullness of the Gentiles. I hope you can... Recollect, and you have in your mind and your heart what those two terms. We talked about those one, uh, two or three weeks ago, and then last week we talked about the fullness of the Gentiles. And so I won't keep going back, 
But if we don't understand these terms and phrases in the scripture, then it's impossible really to understand and gain knowledge of what Jesus was talking about. So make sure if you have it, go back and revisit our talk when we looked at those terms. But they are very much connected to the kingdom that, they were, that the disciples was asking Jesus about. They asked Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom at this time? Now, what were they looking forward to? So let's stop for a minute. If you could describe population that begins here in Genesis, that's a good place to begin. Hello, how are you? The Book of Beginnings. And if you could imagine, this is a great river. And here we see this great population growth as we have record in the book of Genesis. But then there comes a point that we have a, divide, a division in this river. And that is we have a man named Abraham. And Abraham, in Genesis chapter 12, he... Uh, is given instruction by God. He encounters God. And God establishes in Genesis chapter 12 and then in chapter 15, God establishes a covenant with Abraham. And that covenant becomes very important because it establishes the beginning of a people. A people called of God, set apart by God, a kingdom of priests, and that is going to become known as who? Who in the Old Testament and New Testament? What are the names? Right? Israel. So the Jewish people. So through Abraham, a covenant, God establishes a covenant, a promise. And in that covenant, he promises a people. Now, he promises visually a people, that is physical descendants, but he also establishes a people of spiritual descent. And that can be found in Galatians. If you study the book of Galatians, it says that those who by faith have received Christ, we are the children of Abraham. Why would it say that? Well, it says that because Abraham was a man of faith in God. The Bible says that he believed God and God credited it to him for righteousness. His faith was credited righteousness by God. So a person, whether they be in the Old Testament or the New Testament, we have all been saved, that is, we have a relationship with God, not based on works, but on faith in God's promises, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New. Abraham placed his faith in God and God, if you recall, he said to him, I want you to look out at the sky and I want you to see all those stars. That's the number of your descendants. If you could number the stars, that will be your descendants. So he was speaking of first, a people called Israel was going to be born, a nation of priests. And then the, the nation of Israel, we're going to study about them. They're going to have a covenant with God called the Mosaic Covenant. And God is going to establish with them an order of priesthood. They were to be a light in the world. The Jewish people were called upon by God to be his witnesses. That's why they were chosen in the Old Testament. To give a light to the world around them. So that people could see that there's one God. And to know that there's one God, the Creator. Yahweh, the Almighty God. And so, Abraham is that break in this river. Where God has made it known to him there's going to be a physical nation called Israel. And then there's going to be a spiritual side, a population. He says, out of your seed all the earth will be blessed. Who is the seed of Abraham that Jesus was... Uh, well, just jump. Who is uh, God speaking of in his covenant? Who is the seed that through that seed the earth would be blessed? Jesus was the seed. So then we have, thirdly, though, there was also the uh, promise that God made to Ishmael. Recall that Abraham had a son named Ishmael, and God also promised to, to create a nation of people out of Ishmael. So we see that Abraham is a very important point in the history of humanity. For here, God made a covenant with Abraham. Now, what is a covenant? Anyone? A covenant. 
A contract. Yeah. A contract that lists uh, promises made. Right? Now, God made several covenants in the Old Testament. And I think it's important. It's very important as we study Bible prophecy. Uh, it's important to understand these terms. So I hope you're interested. I hope this interests you. And because I think if we lay the right framework, the right ground, the, 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 the foundation, this, I think, as we move along, I think it's going to, I think, hopefully help us all to grow in that knowledge. And many of these things, I'm sure you know, this may be refreshing some things. But what is a covenant? It's a contract. And in that contract are promises and stipulations. And God made several in, with, in the Old Testament. So what are a couple of those? I'm just going to list them without going through them all. Uh, there's first, there's, and we add an IC to these, but there's the Edenic, so of course the Garden of Eden. There was a, a contract made or a covenant made. And then following that, we read after Adam and Eve had failed God, that God made a covenant with Adam. And so we have a second covenant. And then we come to a man named Noah. And we'll put an IC on there, so we're right. There's another covenant in chapter 9, Genesis chapter 9. God makes a covenant with Noah. And you can read that in Genesis chapter 9. And study what God said to him. That's also often referred to as the covenant of human government. That God set up that, uh, a human government. And how uh, we are to conduct ourselves. And so then we come after Noah. Another covenant was made. And we just talked about that one. And so that is a covenant. And so now we're at four. And after Abraham. We come to another covenant. And so if you look at Genesis, so reference points, this is Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15, and then we have a covenant made with this Moses, so we could say, a, or sometimes it's called the Sinai uh, covenant, and this is found in, in Exodus, if you start reading in uh, the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus, and so that is a covenant that God makes with Moses and this people that God has called from Abraham and he gives them laws and how they are to behave and conduct themselves and how they are to continually offer sacrifices to God. Those sacrifices were to be a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ and what he would do on the cross. And so the people of Israel becomes very important. For out of Israel, out of the people that God had made a covenant with Abraham, what do we have from Israel? Well, one, we have God's Word. Right? Moses, a very important writer of the Scripture. He was from Israel, a Jew. And uh, who else? Writers of the Bible. Landon? Name a writer. Any. Any writer. John. John. Was he a Jew? He was. Who else? Anyone? Luke. Luke. Anyone else? Matthew. Matthew. Daniel. Old Testament. We have all these lists of men who God used. One author, but many writers. That wrote the scriptures. But they were all of Jewish descent. They all came through the covenant God made with Abraham. So, and then we have the covenant that God made with Abraham and Moses. And out of these covenants, God had promised one would come who would be a deliverer. Moses was a deliverer. He was a foreshadowing, though, of the deliverer, the supreme deliverer. Who is who? Who is the supreme deliverer? Jesus. And so through the Jewish people, Jesus was born. So we have many promises that God made, covenants that He made. Let's keep going. We're not done. After Moses, we have another covenant. It's, it's sometimes different people call it different things, but the Palestinian or Palestine, it's a, a promise about a land, a promised land that God made. And so we'll study that in more detail with time. And then we also have a promise given to a man named who? David, the Davidic covenant. 
And this is very important because what did God promise to David? What did God promise to David? Because this is very important with this scripture. When we go to Acts and they ask Jesus, uh, are you, when, is going to, when are you going to set up the kingdom? Are you going to set up the kingdom? They're talking to the resurrected Jesus and they, they recognize Jesus as the king. He had demonstrated that he was truly the king. And so they asked him, are you going to, when are you going to set up the kingdom? We really we understand you who died on the cross, you were raised again through your miracles, by your power and what you've said and done. We recognize you are truly the Messiah, the one that God promised would come. What did God promise to David? Anyone? David was whom? A king. And he's probably, except for Jesus, he's the most recognized king of Israel. But what did God promise to David? A kingdom, right? He promised David a kingdom. Thank you, Ed. And so if you have a kingdom, you must have a king. And so this Davidic covenant, so we have a promised land, a promised people. We have a promised deliverer, a king. And so that's what, is, that's what the Jewish disciples were asking Jesus. They were saying to him, are you going to establish the kingdom right now? Because they knew the Davidic covenant. They knew God had promised there was going to be a king and there was going to be a kingdom. For example, open your Bibles to the Old Testament, to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9 and join with me. Would you please do that? Isaiah chapter 9. And here, the scripture is describing a child. And verse 6, we read this oftentimes at Christmas. And Isaiah, the ninth chapter, verse 6, it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Who are we talking about? Who's the scripture speaking of? Jesus. And so verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And so when Jesus establishes his kingdom visibly on earth and establishes God's order on earth, he will uphold it. He himself will establish a kingdom. And this is the kingdom that he was being asked about in the book of Acts. These faithful followers, his disciples and others, men and women who are following Jesus, they looked at Jesus and said, King Jesus, are you going to establish the kingdom? What were they looking for? They were looking for the promise God made to David. Because they knew God's promises will never be broken. And so they were saying, is now the time? Is now the time? And Jesus said, you don't need to know the dates and the times. But what you do need to know is you're, you've been called to be my witnesses. And you're going to take the gospel of the kingdom. And you're going to share it with the world. And as you continually share Jesus with the world, you're going to bring an end. Or you're going to complete the fullness of the Gentiles. Yes, Jesus is going to establish the kingdom of Israel. He is the promised king, and he's coming again to establish the kingdom of God on earth. Remember what Jesus taught us when we pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In earth as it is in heaven, God's kingdom as described under the Davidic covenant, is yet to be established visibly on earth. And so we want to get into that because it gets kind of confusing. And I want to close talking about that for a moment. The kingdom of God is where the Lord rules in people's lives. And so today, 
We are preaching the kingdom message. The gospel of the kingdom. Sometimes we talk about the gospel that Jesus died on the cross and he was raised again and God forgives our sins. Wonderful truth. And that is so very true. But yet we also are to include that we are preaching to all people that God's kingdom is here in our midst. It is near by faith. We receive, as it was promised to Abraham, this spiritual, this spiritual kingdom. And that is, when we receive Jesus Christ, we have received the King of Kings into our lives. And now we have, been, we have now become part of God's kingdom on earth. We have been removed from the kingdom of darkness, and we have now been translated, transferred into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Let's look at Scripture to support that. Can you say that again? Well, let's look at Colossians, the first chapter, and I'll try to say that again, hopefully more clearly. Open your Bibles to Colossians, the first chapter. Verse 12 of Colossians in the New Testament, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you. In some text you'll find redemption through His blood. But He has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. So we have been brought into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus, through faith in Christ Jesus, the resurrected Lord. We have been rescued from the domain of darkness, and now we have been moved by God's power into the kingdom of His Son. Look at Philippians. So if you go back, Philippians, the third chapter. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. But our citizenship is where? In heaven. And we eagerly wait a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship. We are citizens of a kingdom. Israel, those who were these faithful Jews, who are also part of this spiritual kingdom. I don't want us to make this mistake, and I fear that I have listening. I like to go back and listen to what I said, because I don't like to feel like in my heart I have made mistakes, especially with God's Word. I want it to be clear is that Today, faith in Jesus Christ saves both the Jew, the Gentile, it saves men and women, boys and girls. Today, we are one body in Christ, and we're going to get to that. It's very important to understand that. There's no longer Jew and Gentile in God's kingdom. That does not mean that God's promises have been forgotten or erased. God's promise to David that he was going to establish his kingdom on earth and he was going to establish his kingdom by a king, the eternal king, the Messiah, that promise will never go away. God's promises never are going to dissolve or be broken or forgotten. But what is important to understand is in today's dispensation of grace, we all, whether you be Gentile, part of this river of humanity or part of the physical descendants of Abraham called the Jews. All who place their faith in Christ are part of God's kingdom, the church. We are the church, one body. And we are members of His kingdom, citizens in His kingdom, spiritually speaking. But it's very important that God made a promise and that promise to David is that there will be a king and there will be a kingdom established on earth and it's coming. 